Okay, so thank you for being here in spite of the, of the weather. Um, so my, my lectures are about uh, laser cooling. So as I am very lazy, so um, I have never made slides and I write on the board. So I hope that you can read my handwriting, otherwise you just uh, shout and uh, I will try to rewrite the things better. <coughs> so um, laser cooling uh, is born in uh, 85 officially. So with the, the first mod, uh, based on idea that uh, in the present memory of history uh, go back to the uh, 75 to 75 with the proposal of ancient shadow uh, but as Jean-Michel pointed out already in the, the 50s uh, Kastler who was working on optical pumping just suggest that optical pumping can also uh, cool atoms and we will see it in the, probably in the third part of my lecture, uh, really uh, a case where optical pumping uh, is directly involved in the, the cooling mechanism. So uh, probably the first mod is in 87, so it is uh, probably older than all of you. Uh, and so now it becomes really a, a basic tool to do something else and so it is not anymore except by my group uh, studied b for, for itself and for its properties so uh, ju just one question no a few questions uh, have you ever seen a mod working? Yeah. Yes? All of you? Uh, who is a theoretician? Who is an experimenter? It's theoretician. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Not so many. <laughs> so, no, no, no. It's okay. Okay, so, uh, and all the others are experimentalists, and so you are already working with a mod. Okay. So my task is rather difficult because I have to introduce the basics of laser cooling to guys that use laser cooling every day. And so uh, it's uh, a bit um, uh, embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> OK. So just to sketch my lectures. The first part will be devoted to the two-level atoms. And in fact, I will always try to underline <coughs> the assumption and the hypothesis and the limits of the, the calculation you are using uh, every day. And so the next step is uh, uh, the light force. And usually I put a S because, and then when we will reach the limit of the two level atoms, we just will add a third one and uh, uh, a new physics open as soon as you add one level. And uh, then we go on, but with no limits. So it is more levels. So more than three. And uh, the, the, the fourth part will be uh, beyond the, the mod. And in fact, this is my, my research uh, today and in, in which, in fact, we consider interaction between the atoms in the mod and the mod becomes 
a nonlinear object studied as a nonlinear object with nonlinear dynamics and instabilities. There's maybe here, so this is ta -ta, ta -ta. and it is the, the Doppler cooling. And this is the sub Doppler. So in this part, we will uh, try to at least have a good idea of the limit temperature and so on. So it doesn't mean that today I will treat this point and, and tomorrow this one and so on, because my lectures are not uh, calibrated exactly. But so a two-level atom. So the first remark is that the two-level atom does not exist. <laughs> and so, in fact, it is always an approximation. And you have learned probably that an atom is something with an electron, maybe two electrons, sometimes more, but it becomes too difficult. Usually one is simple, uh, which is orbiting around a nucleus. And you have a ground level. You have somewhere a ionization level. And in between, you have a lot of levels. And so what is a two-level atom in, in this context, in the context of laser cooling? So an atom is never a two-level atom. It's only when you consider a specific problem. And in our case, the specific problem is to look uh, atom, light, or laser, or light, interaction And for the moment, we will look at what is known as the semi-classical approach. So if I add semi-classical approach, you clearly understand that there are other possible approaches. And Probably Jean-Michel will treat some other uh, way of uh, approaching the problem. And maybe I will also treat it in when uh, we will deal with subdoppler cooling. We will also uh, see some uh, breast atom approach. And so the system we are considering is an atom plus a laser field. And our laser is said to be monochromatic, which means that we have only one frequency in the uh, electrical field, which is denoted omega L. And it is also intense, which was what uh, Jean-Michel drew this morning in the face place. You have uh, noise, but which is very far from the origin. So the amplitude, the classical amplitude of the field is well defined. In fact, the field will be considered as a classical oscillating field. And so we just write the laser field, EL, which is a vector, which depends on time. And it is 
So Jean-Michel would add a plus here, but anyhow, I did not add a plus, but it is the same. And plus complex conjugate. And obviously, this field can depend also on the position. And so you have a field that depends on time with only one frequency, which is important, and with space. And for the moment, we will not uh, make any approximation on the shape of, the, of what uh, gives the, the, the envelope of the, the, the amplitude or the, the field. So very often, so this is a complex number. And uh, very often, it is uh, convenient to introduce real quantities because we feel them better, or I don't know, just another representation. And so we will introduce the amplitude of the field, which is just the norm, so obviously depending on R, and a phase which depends also on R. So it gives you that the field E of R is a polarization which can depend on R. The amplitude, which depend on R, obviously, and exponential. I put a minus. Yes, usually I will put a minus. Minus I pi of R. So, in fact, here we have a two-dimensional vector, no, three-dimensional vector. And here, this remain complex. For instance, if you have a circular polarized light, it is a, your polarization is complex. This is a real quantity, and this is a real quantity. <coughs> OK, now we have almost our system. So it is this classical field and a real atom. So a real atom has a lot of energies En, and you have between these levels, you have some transition with uh, frequencies uh, omega j. And now we have, we reach the assumption If we have one of these omega j, which is almost equal to the frequency of the laser, then we feel that the two levels up and down for this transition will play a specific important role in, in the system. And so usually we define the detuning as the difference. So usually this omega j, we just call it omega zero because it is simpler. As soon as you have one, you call it zero. And so the detuning is omega l minus the uh, frequency of this transition. Uh, I use a capital delta for the detuning because I come from nonlinear optics and very often in nonlinear optics you have another frequency difference and which is smaller and it is more natural to use the small delta for the small frequency difference and the big delta for the big one. But it's just a matter of convention. In, in most of the literature, the detuning is noted uh, with a um, a lower case uh, delta, but I prefer the uh, capital delta. 
So if you have delta, which is much smaller than omega zero and this, so the transition, and this delta is also much smaller than all the other uh, frequency difference. So this is for j different from zero. Then, in fact, so obviously assuming that all the transitions are allowed, you are, but this is just details. In fact, if you have these assumptions, if you have these, sorry, inequalities, then you can uh, treat uh, specifically the two levels. So now you have understood what is your two level atom. In, in the jungle of all the levels of the atom, you just single out the two levels that are almost with an energy difference, omega zero, which is on the same order as the frequency of the laser that you are considering. So note that very often we put here a uh, level J, which stands for ground state, but it doesn't need to be a ground state. Very often in laser cooling, it is the ground state, but uh, not necessarily. So, yes? So the second position is on the field? Yes, for all the other trans possible transition in the atom, you have to be of resonance. You are almost resonant with the transition you are looking. So these two levels, the laser is almost resonant with the transition. And all the other levels are not coupled to the laser because the frequency differences are very large. So, uh, okay. Now, let's continue. Yes, this is. And so very often also we have here, so when this is a ground level, this is just, uh, um, it has no uh, way to decay. And on the other hand, this is an excited level and very often you have a decay rate most of the time directly to the ground state, but not necessarily. Okay, so this was A, and now next time B. <coughs> Once you have defined your system, then you just have to write the Hamiltonian. So just to recall the system, it is a two-level atom plus an external classical electromagnetic field plus the quantum vacuum and so the Hamiltonian is just the atom plus the coupling between the atom and the laser field plus the Hamiltonian of the vacuum and plus the coupling of the atom with the vacuum. So in fact here I introduce the vacuum just to throw it away next on the next step 
and just to induce the relaxation of uh, the, the upper state. And obviously we add a reservoir of a uh, lot of uh, virtual photons, which has a lot of energy. It, the energy diverges, but it doesn't matter. It, you, do, you cannot <coughs> extract any energy from this vacuum. And so if, even if it, the energy is very large, it doesn't matter. So in fact, these two terms will be dropped uh, very soon but uh, just they are introduced here to, to reach the master equation in a few minutes. So the atom, so this H, and it is just the projector on the excited state because I took the energy zero on the ground state plus P2 over 2M, where this is just the uh, momentum operator. And obviously, when I will need it, I will also have uh, a position operator. Okay, so now the coupling. I will assume that the transition is sensitive to the <laughs> dipolar electric transition. So it's a dipolar electric transition. So the coupling is just a dipole scalar the field. And uh, usually, you do not have in an atom any static constant uh, dipole, uh, but the dipole is due to the coupling to the field. And so the D, usually we write it as D, so E, A, J plus D dagger. So in fact, the dipole appears uh, by the, the coupling from, so the, the coherence between the ground state and the excited state. And so D is usually called the reduced dipole element. So at that point, we know the field, we know the expression of D. So here you have two terms. Here you have two terms, which means that if you just make the product of the two, you will end up with four terms. And four terms is too much. Or too many, I don't know. Okay, so. It will appear after, afterwards. So I just noted here. So this is the uh, momentum operator. So uh, I put it here. But at some point, we will also need the position operator. I guess that the, the, the position of the center of mass of the entire atom instead of the elevation of momentum. In fact, this is when we uh, switch from the description of the atom as an a quantum object to the semi-classical uh, description of the atom. Then we will uh, replace the operator by it mi its mean value. Okay. It is two pages later. <laughs> so. DAL operator. So it is minus D operator E vector only. 
And here, yes, the, here it appears the position. Here I had the vector, the, field, the electric field, which is classical, which depends on the position in space. As soon as you drop an atom in this field, then here it is sensitive to the uh, position operator of the atom. You had a question. Is the emission conjugate? Yes. Uh, no, maybe you are right. Uh, pum pum. Is it a uh, probably it is a star? You are right. It is a complex conjugate. If you have a vector, you have I I I its component in any basis, and the complex conjugate of the vector is uh, it has uh, each component is a complex conjugate of the component. Um, Yes, um, this is a point I have to, to check if it is a dagger or a star. Star? Star, star. star. yes. <laughs> okay. And obviously, so this, uh, I rewrite it so that I can erase it from there. It is one half epsilon L of R. E L of R exponential minus E omega L T plus P of R and plus. Hmm. I don't know if it is CC or OHT. It doesn't matter. And so, and D. Is D so it's was a G S star so two two component in a product you will have four terms and we will split them immediately in a resonant part which is minus one half d epsilon l of r e l of r a j exponential minus e omega l plus c c HC. So this is just a matter of religion. No, this is clearly you have a explicitly an operator and a non-resonant part, which is almost the same. Expect except that you have some stars in some positions. Okay. So, yes. Yes. Yes, it is. Uh, I assume that my transition is a, a dipolar electric transition. Yes, because otherwise you, you will have some uh, other uh, terms. And uh, so I assume, and I will treat only this case in the lecture, the case of the dipolar electric transition, which is the, the case for laser cooling in most. So if you are working with an alkali, you are working on a dipolar electric transition <coughs> and everything is fine. Okay. Yes, I 
Facebook. I can erase all this. Okay, so this is the non non -res resonant. This one is resonant. This one is non resonant. And I will try to show that you can drop this one <coughs> and keep only this one. And the reason to do that is that, uh, in fact, we will make the rotating wave approximation. So in short, WA. And in fact, we will uh, just wonder what is the natural frequency for this term. And so we just give it a name, a raising operator, S plus, which is just E G, so sorry. So it takes the atom in the ground level, it put it, it in the uh, upper level, so it is the raising operator. And so what is is natural evolution? Free evolution. And it turns out if you go in the Eisenberg picture, you just have to write that S plus Vt is just 1 over I H bar S plus times, so it's ju it just the atom, so it ju you just have to here, to put here, the and it turns out that it is minus h bar omega zero divided by i h bar s plus, which means that the natural evolution for s plus is exponential. So it goes like exponential omega zero t, which means that here, this term, you have an ex this part evolve as exponential omega zero t and you have here minus omega l t and so it turns out that in this part what will appear is exponential minus e delta t plus the phase and due to the assumption I just erase, this exponential evolves much slowlier, slowlier, much more slowly than this term in which you have exponential omega zero t plus omega l t, which means that this, um, this term evolves as the op with the optical frequencies, while this one evolve only with the detuning. The, uh, as a and you have, when you will consider the effect of the perturbation, the resonant perturbation will, will have a very strong influence <coughs> on the, the, the result, while the non-resonant one will just uh, can be dro dropped uh, easily. Any questions? Yes. Um, so is there what, what's the physical picture of this non-resonant? In fact, thi this one is just, um, so what is the, In, in, 
in fact, a, a way to, to see that uh, in, is to really introduce the uh, rotating frame. And so instead of just considering the G and the E levels, which are separated by uh, omega zero, you introduce another state, which is E exponential E omega zero T. And so this uh, level, you, you just subtract this energy. And this, at this point, this uh, term is just a coupling between the two uh, very uh, close level, just a constant coupling or almost con constant because you have just the detuning. And so it will strongly couple the two. And so this, this is just instead of, um, of looking at the atom in a constant frame, you just change and rotate with the, the field. In fact, yes, yeah. <laughs> it is the, I, if you go to the, 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 the quantum field, then this, this term is just, you go from the ground state to the excited state by annihilating a photon. And here you go from the ground state to the excited state while creating also a photon. Uh, and so this uh, doesn't work. And so you, you can drop it. You agree? Yeah, absolutely. It's, uh, it's processes that are, that are there, that are physical, that are energy conserving. So we can say they are not energy conserving. No, it's Hamiltonian. Uh, every time it's energy conserving. The switch play little role because in the quantum picture, the correspond to the third non resonance diagram to happen, like to realize switch play. And in the uh, classical world, frankly, you, you can think of wh what you have here is a real field that is oscillating in one direction, going like that. And they, they can expand it into counter rotating things. And naturally, the, the atom, so to speak, is rotating in one direction. So one goes with the atom, the other goes again. And so it has no, no, no effect in the right. So it's precisely the So, any, uh, any other questions? No? no? Okay. Just two remarks. Yes, U usually we introduce a Rabi frequency, omega one of R, or of R, depending if you are classical or, so it doesn't matter, which is just this prefactor more or less. So usually you put h bar gravity frequency which is equal to the d epsilon of r. I do not rem never remember if it there is a 2 or not. Uh, no. And the amplitude. So this is usually, if if you assume that you have chosen the the good, the proper phase, then uh, this Rabi frequency can be real, but it doesn't. If it is not real, so it is not anymore a frequency, but you can understand and do things together uh, with that. So uh, the first remark is that uh, for the rotating wave approximation to be valid, you have also to assume that the Rabi frequency is much smaller than the optical frequency. This is always true in the optical domain, but if you go 
to the microwave, then this can be not true at all. And so you have to be careful in applying the rotating wave approximation if this condition is not fulfilled. The other remark is that also if the detuning becomes on the order of the frequencies, typically if you just are playing with a CO2 laser with your alkali atoms, then you have a very, very large detuning. And at that point, you are not allowed to drop the, the second term because more or less both are rotating at the same frequency. Yes, also the two level. So the two level, a big question mark. And probably it is not anymore true, but anyhow. So, so we will see again the rotating wave approximation in, uh, in, a, f in a few minutes, maybe tomorrow, but uh, <coughs> uh, not, so, not so far when we will solve the optical block equation. So now, we have still one term, two terms here, which are the Hamiltonian for the vacuum. <coughs> and in fact, we just write that it is a sum of H bar omega L, which are the modes and we have the creation, annihilation uh, of field. And we have the field operator uh, for the vacuum, which is proportional to, for, so for L, is just AL dagger plus AL. And so if we just write the atom with the vacuum, we will also assume that we keep only the resonant term. And it turns out that it will be proportional to the sum. So this is the sum that is here. And it is a J, A, A, sorry, A dagger L plus emission function. So this is just to be complete. And now we are just, we will address the main point, which is now that we know almost everything, what can we compute? I don't know if I have to put the S already or not, so just. So, first point, which was already in the title, but now I have to, to make it explicit. So, I will change before. And so the basic idea is to replace the operator by something which is simpler, which is just the position. And so by definition, this is a kind of average value of the operator. So obviously this is a vector, but, uh, and uh, the same for the, momentum, we go from the operator to the classical momentum, which is by definition some mean value 
But obviously, the quantum object is a wave packet. And so it has also a, a variance for the position and a variance for the momentum. And to be valid, the semi-classical description, you have to put constraints on these quantities. So usually what you will say is that the spread for the wave function of your atom has to be much smaller than the characteristic uh -huh. length. And what is the characteristic length in your problem? It is just the wavelength of your laser. Usually, instead of the wavelengths, you, d you put the, the wavelength divided by 2 pi because it is m more fun and it is 1 over the wave number. And then again, you have delta p, which has to be smaller than a characteristic momentum. And this is slightly more difficult to grab uh, what is the characteristic momentum in our problem. The wavelength, it is easy because you have a laser the wavelength is well defined and, and so on and so on. For the momentum, I just will use some hand waving arguments. Just consider that your atom split in two parts with two different momenta. So you have a momentum P1 and a momentum P2. And so in the laser field, these two uh, momenta will lead to Doppler shift which are just k scalar. So in a plane wave, consider a plane wave, one or two. So divided by m. So, so this is a, uh, the sh Doppler shift. Minus, but it doesn't matter. And if the atom can be sensitive to this Doppler shift, then you will have to treat the two parts, the two momenta, independently. Because the two parts of the atom will interact with the field in a different way. So the condition to treat the atom as a classical one, a classical object, is that the difference in the Doppler shift should be smaller than what the atom can feel. And the atom, the quantity, the characteristic uh, frequency difference that the atom can feel is just the natural width of the excited state. So if you have the natural width which is much larger than k delta p over m, so it depends on big m, yeah, sorry, then you will consider the atom just as one classical object. This, if this condition is not fulfilled, then you are completely out. So now I apply Heisenberg uncertainty. And 
which tells you that h bar delta r delta p and as delta r should be smaller than lambda bar you have this and p so p must be smaller than h, uh, gamma divided by k and multiplied by m then it turns out so this is m uh, k gamma and rewriting this in fact it is m gamma divided by k squared and if you just recall that uh, h bar k squared divided by m is the so-called recall in so you recall energy in fact this is this quantity is the energy that an atom would acquire if it is at rest at the beginning and it just absorb one photon then it will have sorry h bar squared k2 divided by and you end up with the what is called the broadband condition which can be written in uh, in several uh, way but uh, the the one i use here it is divided by m much smaller than h bar gamma so if you just calculate this for uh, for cesium then you you find that uh, you have to compare 1 and 1000 and something so this is for cesium so for cesium it is well well uh, 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 verified but obviously you can find conditions where uh, this broadband condition is not fulfilled so obviously you can make cal calculations but not the semi-classical ones and i will not consider them here uh, i have started a long time ago uh, hmm? you have a question can you define that big bar operator you try to define the average value of the small r sometimes. Do you mean that? No, in fact, the small r yeah. is the, the classical position. Oh, the small r is the classical position. And it is the m mean value uh -huh. of the operator, the quantum operator. So the big r is the quantum operator. Yes, the big r is the quantum operator. It, it's uh, also a, a hat. The hat means that it is an operator this hat it's not not always a hat but it looks like a hat and it means that it is an op a quantum operator in in fact it, it is al also it is always the, the same description as uh, Jean-Michel pointed out you have somewhere you have a wave packet which can be uh, an, atom, um, an electric field or it can be the atom you know the, the atom is somewhere here and now the question is these dimensions which are x and p so this is in uh, the quantum picture it's just you have a wave packet with a, a certain ex extension the the problem is that uh, if the extension is 
very large, then clearly you have to consider the atom as a quantum object. If you can just neglect the extension of the wave packet and just consider the classical object which is just in the center of this wave packet, you are in business. This is a classical atom in a classical field and everything is fine. In fact, um, consider the collective motion of the electron and the electron rotating about the neutron. And I think, I think they have mm. been somehow taken into account in the, in the internal energy level. So the external motion doesn't really satisfy the, the, the uncertainty. In terms of so the, the, uh, the, the underlying description of the electron orbiting <coughs> around the nucleus is already taken into account in the uh, levels of the atoms. Yeah. So when <coughs> I write E or G, it is already that I took into account the, 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 the coupling between the electron and the nucleus. Yeah. And then what I am now doing is that I am taking these energy levels and just shaking them with the electric field. <coughs> the internal structure yeah. is already taken into account. Yeah. Now I am just taking into account the external degrees of freedom, the de degree, uh, the, the, the motion of the, the atom as a whole. <coughs> I am not splitting the atom between the nucleus and the, the electron. This is already done in the uh, levels of the atom. Okay, the internal space satisfy an uncertain potential, and also the external space also needs to satisfy. Yes, the the, the 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 space of the external degrees of freedom has to. Uh, you have operators, and these operators have to satisfy <coughs> the the uncertainty principle. I am lost. <laughs> Where? Okay. Yes. So maybe yes, the semi-classical description, and now I arrive to the B, which is the typical. Time scales. I am getting tired, and so my handwriting is uh, not improving. <laughs> so, the first time scale that we have to take into account is the internal uh, time scale, which in and the meaning of that is ja that. It is the time for the internal variables, so to say the population, the occurrences, etc., to reach a steady state. So as soon as we consider only a two-level atom, then within a factor of two, this is just the inverse of the relaxation uh, rate, the, the the natural line width of the transition. And now we are interested in the external 
so the time scale to change the position of the atom or the time scale to change the momentum of the atom and so what we know is that if you are saturating then you can exchange photons which are this is the momentum of the photon and you can exchange photon with the rate which is typical gamma maybe one and a half of that but uh, just to have orders of magnitude it's okay which means that you have an acceleration which is this quantity divided by the mass of the atom which can be rewritten as the recoil velocity times gamma and now I will introduce this it is just hand waving arguments and it is the time which is necessary to change significantly the interaction between the atom and the field so to change and so a way uh, once again what change when you change the velocity of the atom is the Doppler effect so some you just to change significantly means that the Doppler effect due to this change in velocity should be on the order of the natural width of the transition and which is one thing that is nice is that combining this and this you find once again which means that the external time is just the reverse of the so this is the um, recall energy divided by h bar and what we had here the broadband condition implies that the internal time is much smaller than the external time and this is very interesting because it means that when you will have to consider the external degrees of freedom then you can always solve the problem of the internal degrees of freedom before looking at the external degrees of freedom you have a kind of adiabatic following of the internal variables uh, governed by the motion the external variables So, no, sorry, this is just, the, the problem is to define this external time. And what I say is that my atom is just interacting with photons. And so, so the photons uh, are carrying h bar k of momentum. And they can exchange the photons at a rate which is gamma divided by 2, but the 2 you can drop and so it means that you have an acceleration 
which has this expression. And from this acceleration, saying that if I, I apply this acceleration for that time, I will change the velocity significantly, which means that the Doppler effect, the change in the Doppler effect due to this change in velocity is on the order of uh, gamma. In, in some way, the definition of this characteristic time is always a bit uh, arbitrary. You can define a, a characteristic time and just change a factor of two or a factor of uh, pi, and, but the order of magnitude is still the same. And so what is nice is that the condition that we have to fulfill to have the semi-classical description allows you to order the two characteristic times for the internal and external degrees of freedom. Okay, now So now the force operator. So once again, we jump in the Heisenberg picture because it is more fun. And we just have to write that dr or dt is 1 over h bar h and if you just obviously I have uh, raised the, uh, the value of h but here you have the external uh, position and so it commutes with the internal variables in, uh, in the Hamiltonian and so the only part that remain is the momentum and square divided by 2m and you are very happy to find that the evolution of the position is just uh, governed by the momentum and obviously which is less immediate is that the evolution of the momentum which is by definition the force operator is h bar p h and here the part in p, t p squared will commute and so this this one disappeared and you have only the vacuum field disappeared also except in the coupling and so you have these two parts and if you prefer you can write that as the gr minus gradient of the AL and minus gradient of V. Okay. So the net result is that the force operator <coughs> is just the gradient of the coupling between the atom uh, and the field and the gradient of the um, coupling between the atom and the vacuum. And so this is the change of momentum due to the interaction with the laser field. This is the change of momentum due to the spontaneous emission. And the next step is 
to go from this operator to the mean force obviously sorry, and we will consider an atom at rest because it is simpler and so we we introduce a kind of classical force which is the mean value of the o force operator and this mean value meaning an average on the atomic state so the internal variable and external variables of the atom and also on the state of the reservoir of the vacuum which is considered as a reservoir and so we just have to write to plug this expression here and we have minus the gradient of VAL and minus the gradient of VA with the vacuum sorry this is operator and so this was the coupling the momentum exchange between the atom and the vacuum field due to spontaneous emission and it is well known that spontaneous emission is isotropic so you have the same probability to emit one photon in this direction or one photon in the opposite direction so it turns out that with this very simple argument of symmetry you conclude that this term is just zero and so you can forget it and you end up with an expression which now we have to work out a little bit because it is an average on the internal and external variables for the atoms and specifically on the internal state of the atom and so at that point At that point, I have to, uh, yes, maybe I will come back to the operators and No, I think that you neglect nothing. It is just that uh, you have uh, the the. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. In, in fact, when you have operators, you have to think of them as applied to a wave function. And then uh, you have the P, you have the product P times that, that times the wave function minus that applied on P applied on the wave function. 
And so if you just um, say that P is a gradient, you have the gradient of a product, which is V times the function, and which turns out to be the gradient of that uh, plus V times the gradient of the wave function. And so the, way the V gradient of the wave function cancel out. And it remains only uh, gradient of V applied on the wave function. Of the atoms. Uh, in fact, you. <laughs> this, this is just uh, uh, yes. The the field depends on time, but you do not average on time. You do not have any fluctuation of the laser field. The laser field is a, a classical field, so it evolves in tal time, but with a periodic uh, evolution, and um, here you have to take it. Uh, the, the average respect to the position and the momentum of the atom considered as a quantum object with a spread and on the internal uh, degrees of freedom which mean that your atom as soon as you shine some light on the atom it will be neither in the ground state neither in the excited state but in some combination of, of both and so this is the average on the internal degrees of freedom. But this depend, this force depend on time. If you modulate your laser, for instance, then you will have the force that depend on time. But it is not, uh, you do not average on time. This is, if you have an explicit dependence on time, then everything depends on time but the average is for each time you make the average on the, the the quantum variables internal and external degrees of freedom but not you do not make an average on time okay uh, yes probably i have time to to write some new things and so just uh, rewrite VAL VAL was H bar divided by 2 omega 1 of R times A J so this is obviously only the resonant part the non-resonant part that is just thrown away from I omega L T plus V of R plus emission conjugate and I need to make so an average on the gradient of the AL on the internal uh, state of the atom. So I want to have this GE to disappear in some, in some way. Anyhow, I can also uh, and then I will go to the fact that if you have an operator A, then the mean value of A is just the trace of sigma A where sigma, so you, you call it rho, but so it depends, you, you find both notation. So this is the atomic uh, matrix density. And in fact, what we have to compute is in some way the average value of 
this operator, which is the raising operator. And so this, I will call it sigma g e. I never understand why we invert the, the index here and uh, there, but this is the convention. And so by it's also the uh, G sigma e. Okay, and now we just have to rewrite this, taking into account this fantastic result that we have here. And so the force, which is all always, I rewrite it so you never forget it. V A L average. You have here. You can uh, derivate that and do not change anything here. And so you have a first term, which is a gradient of omega one of R times sigma g e exponential minus e omega t plus phi of r plus cc divided by 2. So this is just, when I make the derivation of this one, and just keep it, keep this and average hit this. And the second term, is just when you derivate here the, uh, the phase and it comes out to be omega 1 of r the gradient of the phase times uh, sigma g e exponential minus omega l t plus phi of r minus complex conjugate, and all that divided by 2i. And we are very, very happy. Indeed? No? <laughs> In fact, these quantities are usually called u and v, and you will guess that you have a third guy which is called w at the end. And so this is just the real part of sigma j e of t exponential minus e omega l t plus the phase. And this one is the imaginary part of sigma g e and the same thing. And usually if you consider the two level atom, you have the third guy which is one half of the excited population minus the ground state population. And this is the usual uh, three component of the Bloch vector. And probably I will stop here because the next step is the optical Bloch equation. In five minutes. Yes, I, I think I have, it's better to stop here because uh, otherwise it will be 
a bit hard. <laughs> and I am not, uh, we are not allowed to be late because uh, there is the, um, welcome the welcome drink at seven. Yes. Yeah, yes. Minutes, yeah, so I stop here. So here it is a plus, and this one is a minus. And obviously, I forgot to close the bracket, the curly bracket.